everything I've done, every thought I've had, you know everyone, and Lord, you know, every time I fall, still you come to my rescue when I call. Every thoughtless deed, how it seems upset that Lord you give, not what I am due, but mercy. You come to my rescue, you come to my rescue, you come to my rescue. going to turn this um, uh, time over to our puppeteers and let them present to us uh, their show that they did at Last to Leaders. Let's pray, okay? Father, I want to thank you for the time that you've given us today to worship you, to praise you. We thank you, God, so much for your, what your son Jesus did on the cross. We just settle ourselves in for to that for a moment, that thought of the grace that was given to each one of us. We thank you for the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. 
Lord, as we worship you today, we pray that we will worship you from our hearts, in truth, in spirit. Be with Brother Rick as he leads our singing today, with those who will be leading us in our communion thoughts. And Lord, bless us now as we receive this blessing from our puppeteers of Lads to Leaders. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Timmy, what's wrong? Mom, when I was at the ball game last night, I tried to hang out with Jack and his older friends, but Jack acted like he didn't even know me. I heard him laugh and say to the guys, I don't really know that kid, but he does know me. Jack has been my friend since I was a little boy. Why did he say that? I think he is ashamed of me. He doesn't want the cool kids to know he is friends with a third grader. Sadly, Tim, you may be right, but did you know that Jesus had a similar experience? One of his best friends acted like he didn't even know him. I don't think I remember that story. Can you tell me? Well, do you remember Peter and how he's really good friends with Jesus for like three years? They hung out together all the time and had lots of really amazing experiences together. Like Peter walked on the water with Jesus and saw Lazarus come out of the grave? Jesus knew Peter would lie about him. He actually said that he would deny knowing him three times before the rooster crowed twice. What does deny mean, and what does the rooster have to do with it? Roosters crow in the early morning. So Jesus just meant that Peter would tell people he did not even know Jesus three times before his next morning. And that's just what happened. The night before he died on the cross, Jesus was arrested by the Romans in Jerusalem. And Peter thought it would not be cool to everyone to know they were friends. I can't go in there with Jesus. I can't believe this is happening. Being Jesus' friend could get me in trouble right now, and it would not be cool to get in trouble with these Romans. I'm not going to let these people know that I am a follower of Jesus. I don't want anyone to find out I even know him. I'm just going to stand over here and act like I have no idea who he is. Hey, fella, the priest said you could come in here where Jesus is. Are you one of his disciples? I think I saw you with him. No, it wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. What was that? It, it can't be morning already. Wow, it sure is cold out here. They finally arrested that Jesus. He has sure been causing a lot of trouble for the Romans lately. Yeah, I'm glad they finally got him. Now they can have a trial and get rid of him. I bet all those miracles we heard about were just tricks. Who is that guy? Do we know him? I've never seen him before. I have. I know where I saw him. He was with Jesus yesterday. Hey, weren't you with Jesus yesterday? Oh, no, I've been recognized. No, I promise, I don't know him. I really think I saw you with him. Wow, he really talks like those Jews from Galilee. Yeah, that's weird. You have to be one of those guys that came here with Jesus. The way you talk gives you away. I am not lying. I swear, I don't know that man Jesus.
I know a little bit what Jesus felt like. It is awful when your friends are ashamed of you. I know Jesus was probably super scared about dying in the, on the cross, but I bet it hurts his heart when his friend was ashamed of him. So, what can we learn from this, Tim? I am not ashamed of Jesus. I know what it feels like for my friend to act like he does not know me, and I am not going to do that to my friend Jesus ever. I will always tell people that I know him. Hmm. Tim, I'm really sorry about what happened with Jack. You have learned a very important lesson today. We are never ashamed, and that's something to cry about. Andy, my understanding is our kids play second. That was first place, right? That was first place. Amen? Okay. All right. We're, we're going to be paying off the judges next year, so. All right. Okay, I know we're all ready now, right? Everybody stand, please. Jesus, you're, you're my, my firm foundation. foundation. I'm the one who stands secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation.
As the deep thirst for the water, Lord, so my soul runs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul.
come before the Lord's Supper, wonderful, merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we pray. I will be reading from Matthew 26, 26 through 28, NIV. While they are eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and... When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out to many for the forgiveness of sin. Yeah, so I got thinking about that this week. Two things came to mind this week. One, um, you know, after Easter last week, everybody's on Facebook posting all their he is risen, all their family photos, and there's, it's just kind of encouraging to me to see that because a lot of folks, you don't see that out of their normal daily life. Um, so, and then two, I think we way overthink this sometimes. We, sometimes we... You know, we don't think about the way it was, you know, we, Mike's talked about before, the first century church, the way we break bread now, they, he would go, Peter would have a fit probably, but, um, but anyway, sometimes I think we, 
we, we overthink this and we start thinking about everything else instead of just concentrating on the blood and the cross and, and what was done for us at that time. So would you all bow with me now? Heavenly Father, I'd like to come before you now and thank you for um, the, the blood that was sacrificed on the cross for us, Father, and the, and the, and the body that was Father's. As we, as we get ready to take this bread offering, help us to remember the, what it stands for, his body, and, and the way it was broken for us, and, and uh, the sacrifice that was made for us. In his name, amen. Likewise, let's bow for the for the cup. Once again, Father, we have a hard time imagining what it would have really been like for you at, and Jesus and, and and that situation that day, Father. And please help us to, as we drink this cup, to truly think of only the the blessings that have come from this and the the death that that was paid for our sins, Father. In His name, Amen. I guess now as a as a means of opportunity, we have our opportunity to to give back a portion of what we've been blessed with in our lives and like once again it's so easy to 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 just go on and not even think about it, but it's amazing with how many ways that God blesses our lives that we don't even pay attention to until sometimes after the fact. So Heavenly Father, once again we come to you and thank you for this offering. Help us to give it cheerfully with open arms, open open hearts, open minds, and know that um, you are using it for to, to to grow your kingdom, Father, in his name. Amen. Who made the fishy swim, the fishy swim, the fishy swim? Who made the fishy swim, God in heaven above? Who made the flowers grow, flowers grow, flowers grow? Who made the flowers grow, God in heaven above? Who made the birdies fly, birdies fly, birdies fly? Who made the birdies fly, God in heaven above? Who made both you and I, you and I, you and I? Who made both you and I, God in heaven above? Who made the fishy swim, flowers grow, birdies fly? Who made both you and I, God in heaven above? Let's pray. Father oh God, we're so very thankful for the day that you blessed us with today, Father, for waking us up this morning and giving us another opportunity to come to church and study your word and try to better our lives. Father, we pray that you will be with Mike as he gets ready to bring this lesson to us, Father, that it will rattle our lives, Father, step on our toes, that it will bring us to the point that we need to realize that we can do better in life every day, Father, and as we strive to follow you and, and to do better and to live a better life, we pray that you'll guide us in everything that we do every day. We pray, Father, for those who've lost their loved ones. We pray you bring them peace and comfort. We pray for those who have been sick. We pray your healing hand on them. Father, we pray as you'll watch over and take care of us, keep us safe and protect us. In Jesus. Stand once again, please. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul.
Well, I hope it's already been a fantastic morning for you uh, with our young people and the puppet skits. And, and uh, man, I tell you what, we've got a lot of young people that are growing up in the Lord. Amen? Right? This is, this is good stuff, okay? We need to encourage, be a part of, see how we can help nurture our children. Our Sunday morning class right now upstairs uh, that Angela and I are, are leading and teaching is on parenting. We're about three-fourths of the way through that book. Uh, it's been great practical stuff, even for us whose kids are finally out of the nest. Man, we got rid of Hannah Ruth on Friday. Should I be saying that like that? So, <laughs> we took her back to Little Rock on Friday and like, see ya, we're gone. So uh, now she's uh, in a program there for the next three months, and then she will enter the University of Little Rock in Arkansas, or University of Arkansas in Little Rock. And uh, I guess that's different. Um, but uh, we're excited uh, for her and the opportunities that lay before her. Uh, I have been talking about subjects out of First John. Uh, we've been looking at this, and today I want to talk about confident prayer. Confident prayer. But there's also a little twist in this particular passage that I want us to kind of explore a little bit. It's been great because on Tuesday night, being a part of Call to Grow, uh, the group of guys that are about recovering from addictions and uh, uh, looking to Christ and coming to Christ. We've been studying out of First John, and so we touched on this some on Tuesday night. So I thought, wow, this is pretty good stuff that maybe we need to consider in our mind. Um, the key scripture here, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Sounds like he's quoting Jesus out of the Gospel of John, right? John chapter 14, 15, uh, as Jesus speaks about that, if you ask anything in my name, that will I do. So uh, very likely that John is remembering the words of Jesus as he talks about this. Is there ever a time in our lives when we stop praying for people? Now, when I ask that question, automatically, it, your immediate response is like, well, no, well, never. I should never stop praying for people. And we know that scripture, in Scripture that people prayed for one another. There was intercessory prayer all over the Bible that people stood in the gap for someone, maybe an individual, a family, a nation, was very common of intercessory prayer. In fact, we're even told in uh, 1 John, or excuse me, 1 Timothy, and I, it would help if I turned it on Dexter. So <laughs> Dexter told me there's a little lag in our uh, slideshow today, but it's a real big lag when you don't turn the device on. Let's see if that's going to do it. There we go. All right, here we go. Uh, Paul writes to, to Timothy, and he's saying, look, first of all, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions with thanksgiving and thanksgiving be made known for what all people be praying for all people for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and a quiet life godly and dignified in every way this is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth Knowing that we are to pray for our nation's leaders, do you ever feel like, now well, this is kind of pointless, it looks like they're pretty much determined to go one direction when we're trying to go the other direction as believers and as followers of Jesus Christ. So many of our leaders are not professing faith in God and faith in the Bible, and it's evident by the way that they speak and the, and the direction that they vote so sometimes you wonder, is it even doing any good? Is it pointless for me to be praying for someone? And meaning also that are some people too far gone? Are some nations too far gone and have passed the point of repentance and turning around? Well, I think for most of us, I would think we would all agree, I don't ever need to stop praying to God, because God can do amazing miracles, and he can turn the hearts of people. And so we would go to God in prayer about all things, right? But is there a point of no return? Is there ever a place 
or a point that people can get to that God's compassion can no longer be reached. That my prayers for some are to no avail. Look at 1 John. Let's look at this entire passage here and see if it's going to come up. There we go. Now, John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's talking specifically to followers, to Christians, right? The disciples of Jesus. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he's going to hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for. And again, I want to point out, remember verse 14, asking in accordance with his will and asking in accordance with his will, we know, we know that he's going to hear our prayers. Now here it is, verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. Verse 17, all wrongdoing is sin and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Here in this text, John assures us that God answers prayer, right? He, is, he says, I want you to be confident when you go to God in prayer that he answers the prayers of his faithful people. The people that are in covenant relationship with God, those who have accepted Jesus Christ, those, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, those who've had their sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, I want you to know I hear your prayers. And I'm listening to your prayers. This should encourage every single one of us to seek God day in, day out in prayer. Prayer enables us to receive things from God that we wouldn't normally have or be blessed with, those things that are especially in accordance with his will. Does God always answer prayer in the way that we pray? No. Does he answer our prayers in the way that we expect him to answer? Well, no. Sometimes the father says yes by saying no, right? Sometimes he does that. We often, he often answers our prayers uh, for our good by denying the prayer requests that we make. And we trust and we know that God supplies what we need according to his wisdom. Now, you'll remember when Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 he has a thorn in the flesh. And he goes to God on three different occasions. God, please, if you would just take away this weakness, if you would take away this problem, if you would take away this addiction, if you would take away this struggle that I have, I could be a powerful witness. God, would you please take away this thorn? And God tells him, no, three times, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. But he says what? I, I will give you grace. I will give you grace to strengthen you, not just when you mess up, I'm going to give you grace and forgive you. I think that what Paul's referring to is I will give you the grace to sustain you that will be sufficient for you to say no to that weakness that's in your life. I see, that's, that's a different side of grace that we don't talk about. We don't talk a lot about how grace is intended to help you fight off a temptation and to say no to things that are a weakness. John writes and reminds us of the confidence that we have when we go to God in prayer. And in the next verse, he refers to our interceding for other people. Who are you praying for today? Who do you know might be struggling? Who do you know that might not have even become a follower of Jesus Christ? Who, who do you know that's in the midst of a battle, a spiritual warfare and you are praying for them. I want you to know in confidence, or you can pray confidently, that God is hearing and that God will answer that prayer. Now, he has already told us there is a sin that does not lead to death, but there is a sin that does lead to death. In the preceding verses that we already looked at, verses 13, 14, and 15, I want us 
to understand the significance in being confident in our prayer lives. James tries to explain it this way in James chapter 1. He says, if you lack wisdom about what's going on in your life, if you lack wisdom about the trial, the temptation, the struggle, the, the, the testing time that you're in, he says, I want you to ask of God who willingly wants to give you wisdom about that. And so he wants us to seek God about the things that are going on in our lives. And we can go to God with confidence and know that he's going to respond to us and pray. John's example is if we see a brother or sister committing a sin that's not unto death, right? In verse 16. It's a sin not unto death. We are encouraged to pray for that brother. We are encouraged to pray for that sister who is struggling in that sin. And we are confident that God is going to give them life. And that is eternal life. That is the life that's in Jesus Christ. Question. If we do pray for a brother or sister who does commit a sin that leads to death, there is a sin that leads to death, if we do pray for that brother or sister who commits a sin that leads to death, does this passage teach there's really no point in praying for them? Now, if it is, I'm struggling with that. I've kind of been taught in my theology, I don't ever give up. I'm not ever to quit praying for someone that God has the ability to turn the hearts of people. And so when John is saying, I'm not saying that he should pray about that, I'm kind of wondering if John says, man, this is going to be a tough one here. And we should definitely pray for the brother that's committing a sin that does not lead to death. But, ooh, I don't know. Is that what John is teaching us here? Is John saying, you know, we don't really have the assurance that God's going to answer that prayer like he will for the other brother or the other sister. We don't really have the assurance that God's going to give them the life that he refers to in the first situation. So let's first kind of rule out what some might be thinking about. Maybe is this the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? Because we know that if we... Um, if we commit the sin of blaspheme, there's no forgiveness, right? So Jesus says, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, will be forgiven, sin, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, that is Jesus, anybody who speaks, Jesus is talking, anybody who speaks a word against me, right, uh, they will be forgiven. But if you speak against the Holy Spirit, that will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Wow. Whatever that is, I don't want to be doing that, right? Well, what we understand about this passage is that in really actually in the preceding verses of this, we know that the Pharisees have gone out and they're trying to figure out how, how can we kill Jesus? How, how can we, you know, get rid of Jesus Christ? And in verse 24, it says, when the Pharisees heard what Jesus was doing and, and the miracles he was performing, they accused Jesus of getting his power from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And they said, it is by the prince of demons that this fellow drives out demons. So by that admission, they're denying that Jesus is God's son. They're not saying he's son of God, the father, they're saying he's son of the devil and that he's getting his power from that. Well, if they are denying that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, how will they get forgiven of their sins? If Jesus is the only way for us to get back to the Father and they're not accepting Jesus as the Messiah because they're trying to kill him, right? And they're accusing him of getting his power from the devil and not from God, in what way, how in the world can they be forgiven? They can't. Now, this is a very specific sin. Now, I also want to challenge you on this. Paul also writes in Timothy that he was a blasphemer. He wasn't 
blaspheming God the Father. He was a Pharisee. He believed in God the Father. He believed in the Old Testament God, as we sometimes say. He believed that in the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He believed in God the Father. But what he did not believe in was Jesus Christ. Paul was actually blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit. He was saying, he's not the Christ. And even though the Holy Spirit was confirming that Jesus was the Christ, and he confirmed it by the signs, the miracles, the wonders that Jesus did, and the Holy Spirit was saying, this is the Son of God. Every time he did a miracle, the Holy Spirit said, this is God's Son. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. Look at him. He's the answer. That's what the Holy Spirit was saying. And Paul was like, I don't accept him. But we know that Paul is in heaven. So in that case, what? Even a blasphemer was forgiven because he changed his mind. He accepted Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. We know the Pharisees were not followers of Jesus, and they rejected him in every single way. But let's go back to 1 John for a second. First of all, he says, if anyone... If anyone, that's you and me, that's understood, those who are members of the body of Jesus Christ, if anyone, John's talking to what? Christians. We've already established that. As a follower, if anyone sees a brother sinning, a brother has to be a child of God too. This is an, a, a, an erring child of God. So you've got the church members who are seeing another church member who's in error, who is sinning as a child of God. And then he says this, if anyone sees, sees. In other words, this is clear evidence. John does not say, I, I want you to look at their heart. No, he says, look at their behavior. If you see, if there's clear evidence that they're sinning, you need to stand in the gap and pray for them. Now, when a brother commits a sin unto death, the death is so apparent that intercession is no longer something that can happen. Let me say that again. If it's a sin unto death, intercession is something that is not going to help. I'm struggling with this. I want to, no, I'm struggling with this. So let's think about what John has already written to us Previously in this letter, what has John already told us? John has told us, first of all, in 1 John chapter 1, it's coming. There it is. John's already told us, first of all, if we confess our sins, what? God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from what? All unrighteousness. So John's already told us if we go to God and we confess our sins, God is faithful. And he'll forgive us from all unrighteousness. The second thing is, John is saying in 1 John 5, there's a sin which the Lord will not forgive. Well, we just read that he forgives all sin. There's a sin that the Lord will not forgive, though. Is it possible that whatever this sin is, the sin the Lord will not forgive is a sin, any sin, that a brother or sister will not confess. I mean, look, look at our reasoning here. If he will forgive all sins when we confess our sins and he will forgive us from all unrighteousness, then it must be a sin that I'm not confessing. It must be a sin that I'm not asking God to forgive. It really, for this, it doesn't matter what it is. Any sin, any rebellion, Pride, arrogance, I mean, any of the top ten that he speaks about in the commandments, any of those that I'm unrepentant of, that I refuse to confess and seek God for forgiveness, all right? What kind of prayer is heard? Well, James tells us if you will confess your sins and pray for each other, you'll be healed and the prayer of righteous, the man is effective. So I'm supposed to be standing in the gap for people. 
I'm supposed to be praying for people. Because God wants all people to be saved, right? Well, what kind of prayers do we know that are heard? Prayers that are confident prayers. Didn't he just say that if you will pray, you can have confident assurance that God will hear your prayers? Number two, uh, a prayer that is heard is an unselfish prayer, uh, prayers of love. Uh, number three is prayers that are in harmony with God's will. If you ask anything in accordance with God's will, he will hear it. And number four, a prayer that broadens the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praying for God's rule and reign to come into people's life. These are the kinds of prayers that God hears. Here's the limitation. The prayer that one human being prays will not cancel out another human being's free will. If I'm praying for you, and I see that you're involved in sin, and I'm praying for you, but you're unrepentant, my prayer is not going to override your free will. I, I don't see God overriding our free will. I didn't say he can't. I just said I don't see him doing that. He allows us the free will to choose. And if I'm praying for one human being, it's not going to cancel out his decision to run away from God. If he wants to run away from God, that's it. I'm praying that God will change his heart. I'm praying that God will turn him around. But I, my prayer is not going to cancel out his decision to run away from God and reject God. God allows that to happen for every one of us. If my brother continues in sin and exhibits a stubborn, impenitent, and persistent rebellion, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter what the sin is, is John telling me that it's useless to pray for him if he will not repent? We know already that John has called somebody a liar, and it's the Antichrist. Who is a liar? It's the man or the woman who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's the Antichrist. And they deny the Father and the Son. They're, they're, they're missing out on both the Father and the Son when they deny that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. So the question I have is John telling us that there's a sin unto death. Let me look at some Old Testament passages real quick for us this morning. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. I think it's coming. Maybe it's not coming. All right. There's some passages that I wanted us to look at. Let me stir my batteries up and see if that will help a little bit. Okay. Hey, that's God calling. You better answer it. So, I'm just going to go ahead. I want you to listen to these verses out loud, okay? In the Old Testament, there we go. Jeremiah says, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. And actually God is telling him uh, to tell the people, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider, search her squares to see if you can find one person that deals honestly and seeks truth. Can you find one person? And if you find one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. They refuse correction and they refuse repentance. So they're not wanting to repent. Now, he goes on to say, they have lied about the Lord and they said he will do nothing. God's not going to do anything. God's not going to harm us. God's not going to uh, come to us. These people have a stubborn and rebellious heart and they have turned aside and they have gone away. Then he says, their evil deeds have no limit. They do not plead the case of the fathers. They don't defend the rights of the poor. Their prophets prophesy lies, and the people love it. You know what God says? God tells Jeremiah this in Jeremiah chapter 7, 16. As for you, do not pray for these people. Jeremiah, don't pray for them. Don't even lift a cry up a prayer for them. Do not intercede for them, I'm not going to hear you. I'm not listening. 
Jeremiah eleven fourteen. 14. Do not pray for these people. Do not lift up a cry for their behalf. I will not listen when they call to me in time, in their time of trouble. I'm not listening, so don't pray for them. Are you ready for this one? Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 1. The Lord said to me, if Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward these people. Send them out of my sight. I don't want to see them anymore. If the great leader Moses stood in the gap for them, if Samuel stood in the gap, I, 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 would not even, I wouldn't even listen. So he's telling Jeremiah, so there's three people, Jeremiah, Moses, Samuel. I'm not listening. Don't pray for these people. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to do anything. So praying men like Jeremiah are told to stop praying. And you know what the terrible truth is? The guilty people, they refuse to pray for themselves. They're not even praying for themselves. Moses and Samuel are mentioned here in this text because they must have been preeminent prevailing intercessors for their people. They stood in the gap. There's two times that Moses stood in the gap, the golden calf incident, and when the spies came back and they didn't believe, and then Samuel interceded for his people twice, and God changed and heard their prayer on behalf of the people. What it seems is nothing can stop their prayers. In the case of Moses in Exodus 14, God was so upset. He says, I'm going to strike them down with a plague, and I'm going to destroy them. And I tell you what, Moses, I'm going to make you into a greater and stronger nation. And though the intercession and plea of Moses, through that intercession, God says, you know what? I have forgiven them. I've forgiven them. Now, we know the consequence was what? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and everyone above the age of 20 died. He got rid of that generation of faithfulness, but he was going to strike them down, and Moses says, wait a minute, God, please don't. And so God says, I will forgive them. It would appear that nothing could stop the prayers of Moses and Samuel except for the rebellious nature of the people of Israel. Can I commit such crimes against God that no intercession is adequate. In 1 John 5, 16 and 17, what is the iniquity or wickedness that passes the point of no return? Is it idolatry? Is it continual rebellion? Is it an unwillingness to repent and pray? What exactly is the sin of death in this text? I found a very interesting comment in the ESV Bible. It says, sin that leads to death is probably, probably a sin that is unrepented of. I'm not going to repent. Second, of the kind or nature that John has been warning them about all through the letter. And what is that? their rejection of the true doctrine of Christ, that he is God in the flesh, chronic disobedience of God's commandments, persistent lack of love for one another, they're not loving each other, fellow believers. All of these are indications of a lack of saving faith, which will not be forgiven. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the specific sin is, but the suggestion is, it could be any number of things, especially any sin that I don't repent of, any, any sin that I don't confess and make known. Any of these could certainly turn God away from me. What seems to be the case here is obviously persistent, defiant behavior combined with unrepentance. See what Jesus is doing for us now? Hebrews says, because Jesus lives forever, he has a per permanent uh, priesthood. And he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he lives to intercede for I'm glad Jesus is praying for me. 
I'm glad Jesus is praying for you. I'm, I'm hoping that Jesus is praying for our nation and for our community here in West Memphis. I hope Jesus is interceding for our church. When we pray and Jesus is there in heaven, he's, he lives. He lives to intercede for us. So maybe what Moses couldn't do, maybe what Samuel can't do, maybe what Jeremiah can't do, maybe Jesus can do. It's worth a thought, worth considering. Okay? Jesus prayed for Simon Peter. He interceded for him. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. I prayed for you. I prayed for you that your faith not fail. And when you've turned back, I pray that you will strengthen your brothers. Jesus is praying for Simon Peter. He knows what Peter is about to do. This I'm praying that your faith will not fail. Maybe that right there is the prayer that we need to be praying for one another. Pray that your faith. Would you bow with me for this prayer? Father, as we come before you, I'm sure in a in a group this size, there are people that were thinking about maybe it's a brother, maybe it's a sister who's committing sin. And we want to pray for them this morning. Father, I pray that you'll listen to the name that's in our heart, the name that's on our mind, the name that we're about to whisper. Just say their name. We want to pray for them this morning. We want to pray for their confession and their repentance. And we want to pray that, as you promised here in John, that you will give them life. Life in your son, Jesus. Father, we pray for those who are rebellious. We even pray for those right now, who are unrepentant. We pray for our nation, our leaders. God, our, our country is, we don't even recognize it anymore. We have become an ungodly nation who upholds things that are ungodly. And we pray for our rulers, for our president, for our Cabinet members, we pray for our senators and, and all those in the legislation and for Congress and for our governors and we pray for our local administrators, our city council and we pray for our mayors and we pray for those who are making decisions. Father, we pray that they will be godly decisions, that they will turn to you, God, for wisdom and for help. And if there's anything in their life that they need to confess and repent, we pray that you will turn their hearts and they will cry out to you for mercy. Father, we don't want to be a nation that you would look at us and say, no, nope, don't pray. We don't want to be a nation that says, I'm, I'm not listening. I pray, Father, for our nation to turn to you and Father, I pray in confidence this morning that you are a faithful God and that you are working, that you are changing because you want all men to be saved. And I pray for the salvation of people in our community. And I pray for salvation for people in our church. Lord, bless us now as we just contemplate where we are in our lives if there is a sin that needs to be confessed, if there's a sin that needs to be repented of, that we will turn to you and say no to sin and say yes to you. I pray this in Jesus' name.
If we can pray this morning for you, whatever it is, Rick's going to lead us in this song. Let's all stand and let's sing. Please come. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me has made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I So glad to see y'all this morning. If y'all would bow with me and we'll close out. God Almighty, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you that we do have that repentance, Lord God, that we have the ability to turn away from our sin, to lay it down at your feet, to confess it to our brothers and to our sisters, Lord God, the things in which we've done, Father, that we're not we're not proud of, and Lord, that bring us shame. And Lord, sometimes we can get trapped in that cycle. But Father God, we have hope through Jesus Christ. We have forgiveness through him. He is the mediator of this covenant that we have made with you. And Father, we thank you for him and we thank you for each other. Father, we ask that you'll help us to be honest and bold in our confession towards other people so that we can lay it down and turn away and repent from it. Father, we thank you for this all. Be with us this week. We ask that you'll take this message into our hearts and Lord, that we'll take it out to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.